Assalamu alaikum, good evening from Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, one of the most interesting and fascinating countries in the Islamic world. Given the recent revolutions erupting across the Arab world, I thought I'd gain some insight into these events. Here at the Kuala Lumpur city center, I had the chance to meet with an expert on the subject, a rising star in the academic world. Meet Dr. Sean Foley, tenured associate professor of history at Middle Tennessee State University and a Fulbright research scholar at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. A specialist in Middle Eastern studies and religious and political trends in the broader Islamic world, he has also taught at Georgetown University, where he acquired his PhD in history. I began my interview by asking Dr. Foley to define and elaborate on this phenomenon known as the Arab Spring. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Arab Spring is one of the most remarkable political developments in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, and in fact, the larger world over the last 10 to 20 years. It represents the intersection of political forces, of technological forces, as well as social economic forces in the Arab world um, that have been building for nearly a decade. Although many people saw it as surprising and it did happen very quickly, if you look back at the causes in Arab society, there are a number of clues leading up to how this revolution happened. And indeed, when we think about this revolution, it's good to think about the phrase that is heard again and again from Tunisia all the way to the Persian Gulf which is al-shab yuridu iskak al-nizam. People want to overthrow the system. It's a very powerful word, this idea that people need to live in a new society, a society which is neither defined by the materialism of many Arab states or the idea of, of an Islamic form of revival represented by al-Qaeda and other types of salaf, these types of organizations. And again, people desiring to have the opportunity to live in a society that doesn't fit either one, that is a blend that is both sufficiently modern, but also recognizably Islamic. Those were the initial causes of the, uh, what you consider the Arab Spring. Right. Um, can you give us a, a, a primary example of, of the Arab Spring and sort of uh, what, it, what it sort of has manifested itself as? Well, it manifested itself as a challenge to authority to establish, again, this idea of challenging the system of the order. And then we saw the, the hints in this building um, for nearly a decade. If you look at Egyptian literature, for instance, um, young poets over the last 10 to 15 years have emphasized challenging of modernity, modernity conventions. Um, you see it also online. In the, the five to 10 years plus leading up to the revolution, constantly challenging online. Um, one sees in Tunisia, for instance, that a blogger was not considered a legitimate blogger in Tunisia unless that blogger had already been censored by the government. One sees it also in other parts of the Middle East where women would challenge traditional patriarchal structures or authority, openly challenging these leaders to reform those societies and allow women to have greater space. You could see it building. You could also see it building in popular culture, not only in art but also in music. The types of forms of resistance, not using violence, but using popular forms of mass demonstrations, of using civil disobedience, one could see in the music. A good example of that is a man named Maher Zayn, who exploded onto the entertainment scene in the Arab world, and in fact is popular from Morocco all the way to Malaysia. And if you look at his videos, the types of synthesis that he has between modernity and Islam, singing in English, singing with Western tunes, but doing in a court in a context that is definitively Islamic or Muslim, is that type of synthesis. One of the videos I particularly like that shows that type of non-violent resistance um, is Palestine Will Be Free. It's a video sort of typical of how Zayn does his music. Zayn is singing, um, but the center of the video isn't him as it is in traditional video or song. He's singing, but the person who's actually the star of the video is a cartoon character, a young Palestinian girl who we see at the beginning. Um, her classroom is attacked. Um, there are Israeli bombardments, and then it opens up into an urban scene of destruction, a sort of a 
awful context of an apocalyptical scene um, in which one sees Palestinian fighters fighting Israeli tanks and airplanes. But in the penultimate moment, the great moment of this video is when a little girl comes up, the same girls are the star who Zayn has been singing about throughout this whole video, um, and she encounters an Israeli tank. And she raises her hand up. She picks up a rock and raises it up. You can see the fury in her, her face, her anger. And what she's thinking about is throwing that rock at that tank. And it's a strong defiance, a symbol of David versus Goliath. And it's emblematic. It's supposed to remind the audience, particularly Arabs, of a very famous picture of a young Palestinian boy from the Intifada of the 1980s throwing a rock at an Israeli tank, that type of defiance. But Zayn deliberately has the girl drop the rock. Instead, she opens her arms out, and through the force of her, force of her personal will, of her faith in God, that tank withdraws. She forces that tank to withdraw. And one sees that nearly less than a year after Maher Zayn's music, these videos exploded onto the scene. Um, one saw protesters using similar types of tactics, an understanding on their part that a new type of revolution was going to need to take place, but the type of violent tactics used by Al-Qaeda weren't going to work. They had to find a new way of doing that. One sees it similar in the way he talks about the West. Um, you know, he actually has a line, you know, it's easy to blame the West when in fact our problems onto ourselves. We have to solve our problems themselves. When the demonstrations began, they didn't say it's Washington's fault. They didn't say attack Washington. They said we need to change the system at home. And a good example of how, what that meant was very early in the process during the Tunisian Revolution, the one that began this revolutionary process, where they got rid of the president, the man who had been president for many years. And the protests continued even further that day. The Tunisian elites hoped that if they got rid of the president, that that would end the problems. But you see, the problem wasn't about the president. The problem was about the system. He was a symptom of a larger problem. Again, one sees the same problem today in Egypt. Mubarak is gone, but the revolution on goes continues. The question is, can they reform the state? Can they find a way to make this new system come into reality? Getting rid of Mubarak, that was the easy part. Getting a new system is turning out to be much harder and a much longer series of negotiations in society. But again, that's where that's coming from, a desire to create that society. And they had models as well. If you look at the Turkish example, Turkey had, had very close relations with the Arab world. It opened up the new foreign policy. In fact, the man who made that argument of that foreign policy taught in Malaysia, where I'm sitting today for many years, 18 years, at the International Islamic University. Um, argued for opening up Turkish foreign policy and it, it moved a boom in trade, but also cultural exchange. That Arabs began to visit Turkey, began to watch Turkish soap operas and be aware of the Turkish government, that it was a government that was Islamic, recognizably Islamic, but also recognizably modern. If you look at how the Turkish Prime Minister, he doesn't wear an Islamic outfit, he wears a suit and a red tie switch the pin on his lapel, you know, lapel could easily be a Western politician or a modern politician. That ability to blend those two, his ability to do business with the United States, even potentially to do business and to talk truth um, to the Israelis, had a very powerful resonance. In the question among Arabs, like, why can't our leaders make that similar type of synthesis between East and West and profitable? And, and for Arabs, particularly Egyptians, Egypt and Turkey have about the same population, but Turkey boomed over the last decade under this current government. Per capita income under the first five years of the AKP doubled. Um, that's an enormous, powerful stimulus to look at this and say, wait a second, if they can do that, why can't we? You know, that type of, that type of image, again, of a modern society that, that blends East and West, that can be modern, that can compete in the modern world, that can compete with Europe, that can compete with China, that can have that trade, but also still has that certifiably Islamic core that is recognizably Islamic. And this has been a challenge that Muslims have been dealing with on and off in various forms since the 18th, early 19th century. And what Arabs were looking for was a way to answer that question. How can we both be modern, function in the world, but also retain our Islamic identity? 
Um, Turks have been doing it in various forms since the 18th century. They had a little bit more of a head start. But that same desire was there. Um, and, and the Arab Spring represents a desire, a hope, to reach that vision. It's going to take a while, um, but that's where that vision is going. And again, it goes back to someone like Zayn. If you look at what Zayn is, he embodies that vision. He's wearing, um, if you look at him on, on his cover of his album, he's wearing an outfit um, that does not look particularly Islamic. It looks like it could fit into the R&B bar, you know, rhythm and blues. He worked in New York. It looks like he could be in New York. Yeah. And he sings, of course, in English. Yep. And not only in English, but in Western chords, using not only that, but using Western technology, um, using multi, using Facebook. He's actually the first um, first Muslim artist to reach, I think, a million friends on Facebook. But he's doing it in a recognizably Islamic context. That way of synthesizing, and again, it's easy for us to assume that, okay, this is just replicating the West. No, he's not. By emphasizing that type of, using that format, um, by thinking in that type of context with the West, that using Western instrument, you know, West certifiably, recognizably Western things, but doing it in Islamic context, that meaning translates into a different context. It means it's different. And he's not the first Muslim to do it. Lots of, of Muslims have attempted to think about how to do that. Um, but again, his ideas have been particularly successful with that. And it also a type of confidence to be in the world. You know, the deal with America, the deal with other peoples. It's okay. I can be a Muslim and modern and I don't have to be apologetic. I don't have to even be angry. That's a very powerful sense of self-confidence in the world. That I don't have to define myself in relation to the West. I can define myself in the way I want to be. I can take what the West, what I think is good, not do what I don't think is good. That's a very powerful statement of self, of a self-assertion and of confidence. You have to cut.